everyone for coming today. And sorry, we're starting a little bit late. Still waiting just for Lou to join us, but we will crack on um, and then she will join us and we'll move forward. Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, this is a policy exchange event on the future of the UK's transport system, in a particular focus on how the decarbonisation agenda is going to impact the transport sector. Um, thanks specifically to uh, our colleagues at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers for helping us put today's event on. My name is Josh Buckland. I'm a senior fellow at Policy Exchange and before that worked in government on a range of energy and transportation issues in Number 10, in the Treasury and in Bays. Um, and before I introduce the panel, I just want to set some ground rules for today. We've got a constrained period of time. Please keep interventions from the floor relatively brief as a result. Speeches are for the conference hall. Um, and we will try and get through as much and, and as many as your questions as we can in that time frame. Um, we will start with opening uh, comments from the panel. I'll keep those relatively brief. If everyone could try and speak for three to five minutes, we'll then get plenty of time for questions. And obviously, please introduce yourself when you do come in during that period. Um, before I do ask the panel to come in with some opening remarks, and hopefully by that point Lou would have joined us, let me just firstly set the scope for today's discussion. Obviously, the UK's transport system is under the political microscope now and, and has been for some time. Whether that's the state of our privatised rail system, whether that's debates around airport capacity, the state of our roads, the transport system is never part, far from the political debate. And that's going to even be more the case when we actually start to think about how on earth we decarbonise our entire transport system by 2050, if not earlier. It's going to create questions around ownership. It's going to create questions around how we get around, how we actually interact with other road users, as well as obviously the structure and the nature of policy and regulation that sits around that. And obviously that will also raise questions around the transport system and its role in the broader economy, how we finance the transport system, how we tax it, and interestingly, obviously, what the broader socio and economic impacts of the transport system can be. So today's debate is really about starting to open up those questions. How is the decarbonisation agenda going to play out in the transport sector? What are the impacts going to be? And also, interestingly, where are we behind the curve? Where does the UK need to step on the gas, so to speak? And the one thing I'd really like to get in, a little bit of conversation going on today is what are the broader socio and economic opportunities that come from de decarbonisation? If you assume that we are going to decarbonise, what more can the political and economic system change to reflect that and create opportunities for people right across the country? So that's the scope of today's discussion. And as I said, hopefully there'll be time for plenty of questions from the room as we go. Um, to kick things off, I'm actually going to come to Matt Rooney first, um, who is a head of engineering policy at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers and is a chartered engineer and also an alumni of Policy Exchange, which is, which is always nice. Um, so Matt, why don't you kick us off with a little bit of a view of how the institution is seeing the outlook for the transport sector and how the decarbonisation agenda is going to impact that. Sure. Thanks very much, Josh. And thank you to Policy Exchange for putting on this event. I know how difficult and frantic it is for think tanks at party conferences. Uh, so we're the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, we're a membership body of 112,000 engineers and students based in the UK and around the world. And it's my job as head of engineering policy to try to bring the views of our members together to have policy positions for the institution, which is quite challenging to reach consensus when you've got 112,000 people. And it's more complicated by the fact that there are 42 engineering institutions in the UK who have come together under the banner of the National Engineering Policy Centre and I won't get into that today, but I'd encourage you to look them up because they've done a lot of good work, particularly on a systems approach to net zero. And that's one of the things we do tend to agree on in the engineering world is taking a systems approach or a system of systems approach. Sometimes we call it confusingly. And I'm thinking about transport policy. Transport is part of a larger system. And that's going to be increasingly important as we electrify more of it because there might be things like two-way flow of electricity, uh, demand management and vehicle to grid, which will be increasingly difficult to manage as more electric vehicles get on the grid. But I'm just going to summarize three policy priorities for the institution that we've been talking about in the transport space for the past couple of years. And the first is demand management and modal shift, which everyone says doesn't get enough attention and it continues to not get enough attention. If you're going to make any transport policy or any energy policy, from the beginning you should be thinking about reducing demand or in transport modal shift from the very beginning because it's, it's easier to re reduce demand than to create new supply. And this can be quite controversial because we've talked about things like 
you know, no politician wants to say to a constituent that you can't have a car or you can't have a foreign holiday. It's quite controversial, but you can use the carrot approach of making public transport and cycling much more attractive and people will voluntarily give up their car, perhaps. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is alternative fuels, uh, alternative low carbon fuels. And we think electric vehicles are fantastic. It's amazing how prices have come down and range has increased in the last few years but they can't do everything, particularly in maritime and aerospace, you're going to need alternative fuels. But even if you think in road transport, uh, if we're gonna ban electric vehicles, seals, electric car seals in 2030, you're still gonna have millions of vehicles with internal combustion engines on the road in the 2030s. And then you think of HGVs and buses, if you're gonna ban those with petrol and diesel engines in 2035, 2040, you're gonna have thousands of HGVs and buses on the roads in the 2040s. So if we can develop alternative low carbon fuels where we can use the same vehicles but replace the fuel with zero carbon fuels, that could complement electric vehicles. And finally, just uh, an obvious one again on real electrification. Uh, we, th the government have said in the past that you know battery electric trains and hydrogen trains can play a role. And we think they can play a role, but quite a niche role on the lines that are difficult to electrify. We think the government should get on with electrifying the full network. And if this is done as a rolling program where you keep supply chains and, and skills uh, going, then we think costs can be controlled. And finally, I'd just like to say that we at the IMCA were expanding our policy team. We're hi hiring a new director, James Partington. We've, we've nicked him from Bayes. He was deputy director for Fusion there. Uh, we're looking for more collaborations in the future. So if anyone wants to collaborate with us, please get in touch. Great. Thanks, Matt. And I'd like to come back to your modal shift in particular, because I know that's a kind of a hot political issue, which would be good to would be good to debate. Um, and actually might be something that Andrew, I think, may talk about as well. Andrew uh, Gilligan is our next panelist who uh, joins us uh, virtually. Um, Andrew, who many of you know, was a former special advisor in number 10 from 2019 to 2022. Um, and before that was a senior journalist as well as working in City Hall and was on the TFL board. Um, so we'll bring some interesting views on on both uh, national as well as obviously regional transport as well. So, Andrew, do you want to give us your, your opening thoughts and, and we'll then come back to you? Thank you, everyone. Yes. Um, I hope you can hear me. Tell me if you can't. Um, I, I think electrification of the road vehicle fleet is the single biggest thing we can do to uh, reduce the what, what are stubbornly high carbon emissions in transport. But I was always quite worried that some policymakers thought it was the only thing we needed to do, or at least the only thing they were comfortable talking about. Uh, and of course, it cannot be the only thing. Um, the trajectory of EV uptake is quite encouraging, the journey's only in one direction, but there are quite a lot of headwinds, um, rise in the price of some metals, chips, leasing deals, actually the market is assuming, as you know, 90% of petrol and diesel cars are bought on leasing deals, the customer effectively only pays the cost of the depreciation, but with the EVs, the market is assuming quite substantial depreciation, which makes them more expensive. It's going to be, cost parity is going to be achieved. Um, I think somewhat later than some, such as Blue, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, um, were predicting. But, you know, even if none of that were the case, even if everything were going entirely to plan, the CCC and its balanced pathways assess that EV deployment can only get us two thirds of the way towards the reductions in surface transport we need for CB6. Uh, obviously, EV manufacture carries a substantial carbon load, and there is a real risk that because EVs are taxed, much more lightly than petrol and diesel vehicles, they will be driven more. Uh, so cancelling out some of the carbon savings, as we've already seen, uh, indeed, uh, with the adoption of more fuel efficient ICE vehicles, that didn't lead to carbon reductions. Instead, people just bought bigger vehicles. Um, obviously, if you look at other new tech, also has the potential to increase carbon emissions. Driverless vehicles, you know, they may be the revolution that never quite arrives, but if it does arrive, it will significantly lower the barriers to car use. You won't need a license or insurance or a parking spot or a test or, of course, a personal car at all. So why would anyone bother with public transport? Yet, of course, though, driver, lot driver's cars will be more efficient users of energy and road space than a private car. They will still be significantly less efficient users of both those things than a bus or a metro train. Um, so I think we have to start talking about behaviour change, as, 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 as has already been said, essentially driving less. That is much more difficult. Covid may have made it easier. Uh, Covid has reduced um, demand for travel, reduced demand for commuting, not just on the rails, but on the roads. Um, and uh, you know, part of what I was doing in government was, was trying to prove that, that, as has already been said, when you bring in, when you improve facilities for walking and cycling, 
you you you, you get a dramatically increased number of people walking and cycling, um, and we've seen that. Um, even so, it spiked. Of course, it, it roughly doubled during COVID when the roads were quieter. But even now, the roads have gone back to more like normal levels. Um, the number of people walking and cycling is still 30 or 40 percent higher than it was in 2019, partly because of some of the measures we put in. They're controversial, though, and um, there's always an outcry when anyone takes away a parking space or road space for motorists. And um, and I think one of the key tasks that politics hasn't quite managed yet is how you um, overcome that controversy. It's never it's 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 never the majority. Um, normally, these these measures have majority support, but the minority are very noisy. They make, they make much more noise than the than the than the than the, than the minority who than the majority who support these schemes. So I think. Um, Walking and cycling is important. I think um, promoting public transport use is important, and that is where I think we face a, a real crisis. Um, clearly, uh, use of the railways is still nowhere near back to where it was in pre-COVID levels, perhaps 80% in terms of revenue, 90% in terms of usage, uh, and that's something we've got to really to really work on. Again, we had quite ambitious plans for buses and rail, which um, which were to some extent stymied by COVID um, and the and the operation has now become not expanding the, um, the, the use of the bus and rail network on, on, on pre-COVID levels but um, trying to trying to restore its use to pre-COVID levels so those are two important things we have to talk about and I think probably the third thing I just lay on the table something we talked about a fair amount but didn't do very much about is is, is taxation what do we do when the uh, 35 billion a year or so we get in from fuel duty uh, disappears um, that's that's the equivalent to about 6p on income tax we can't do without it um a replacement we have to start talking about a replacement fairly soon so those are my initial thoughts but i'd be very welcome to hear any anybody else's thoughts on the subject too and thank you very much for inviting me thanks so much andrew really useful and uh, some themes that matt also picks up around uh, behavior change as well as obviously uh, different forms of transport not just focusing obviously on the on the electric side and also you picked up an interesting theme around uh, the potential role of driverless technologies which is a seamless transition uh, to sarah gates who is head of public policy at wave um, which is a startup focused on driverless vehicles um, and sarah before joining wave spent some time in the civil service as well as uh, in consultancy so sarah i don't know if you want to pick up obviously on any of the themes that have been given but also just give us some, your general thoughts on on the the outlook for the transport side and then we'll obviously move on to some questions Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me here today. So, yes, it's nice to hear about AVs as part of the decarbonisation agenda. So I think the, the kind of benefits of AVs in a sort of a future transport system um, are not necessarily widely known. So uh, AVs um, is a broad term. So WIV is actually building what would be called level four. So automation goes from level one to level five. Um, and that means we have no, no driver in the vehicle. Um, important distinction between say advanced driver assistance systems that still would have a driver in the vehicle and are much more commonly found in personal um, private cars. Uh, so two key benefits to AVs um, are the overall safety uh, gains that we'll see on the roads with widespread deployment. So someone is killed or seriously injured every 22 minutes in the UK and this is a cost of around 33 billion to the UK economy annually. And uh, over 90% of accidents are caused by human error, so distraction or driving under the influence or just uh, disobeying road rules. So in addition to the added safety gains, um, we also will see less congestion on our roads, so better utilisation of vehicles and fleets. Um, and this needs to be considered in the context of also getting better efficiency of driving. So it's estimated that we will get a 10% reduction in carbon emissions just from the the added efficiency of driving um, an AV. And importantly, related to that, we've only built its AV on a, AVs on an electric platform. And so this 10% reduction doesn't take into account the actual electric engine itself. And something, again, that I think is really important to think about when we're considering the integration of automated technology in, into the transport system is we are not um, building AVs for initial deployments with personal ownership. We are focusing on fleet integration and a, a sort of a special uh, aspect of WAVE's technology is the fact that we can use a lean hardware sensor suite so we can actually build on a variety of vehicles. Um, and we are announcing today our um, demonstration of being able to use uh, one AI model which drives WAVE's vehicles moving from a passenger car into a van which 
shows us the huge potential we have for integrating WAVE's automated technology into the public transport system in future. So we are currently um, starting trials with Aston Ocado for last mile delivery this year, but ultimately when we um, achieve that ability to integrate into a fleet with a w wide range of manufacturers, it opens up huge opportunities for automating public transport across the board. So in addition to less congestion, higher utilization of fleets, um, we also have to think about obviously the space that could be opened up by having fewer vehicles um, and personal ownership across cities. So one Arcadis report estimated that over 6,000 hectares of land could be freed up if we have less parking um, in our cities, which could lead to um, space for 180,000 new homes. And equally, the safety gains have to be taken in beyond just thinking about the direct safety gains from, from you know, accidents and incidents, if people feel more confident being on the road in the long term, you also then obviously have your cumulative effects of uh, opening up uh, cycling and walking being more attractive to people. And if our roads are actually friendlier for pedestrians, you make it um, much more attractive to take green, uh, green options for travel. So there are, there are lots of kind of indirect benefits of integrating AVs into the network, and we see them as a really good way of helping the acceleration to um, EV or electric integration across the board. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and appreciate everyone's opening remarks and everyone keeping them brief and to the point um, so we can get some time for questions. Um, hopefully, Louis, Lou will be joining us in a second, um, but we will obviously keep going while we can. I'm going to and the gentleman in the front has immediately put his hand up, so he's definitely going first, but he's going to go after me, so he's not going to go first. Um, I think one of the themes that has been uh, talked about a lot in the opening remarks has been around modal shift and behavior change. And obviously, one of the things we all talk about when it comes to transport decarbonization is what needs to be done differently from the consumer's perspective. So I'd like to just kind of briefly ask each of the panelists, how do we crack the political nut around behavior change? It's one of the things that people talk about a car being someone's castle, and they clearly don't want to give up on their access to a car. We've talked about some of the benefits that can come from obviously reducing driving. Um, but could people just give me a little bit of a feel for what are the things that could government or alternatively local uh, councils or local decision makers do to actually help in the behaviour change side and avoid it becoming a, a political issue as that it is at the moment? And maybe I'll start with you, Matt, because you've uh, had long since you last talked. Sure, no problem. Well, I think the first point is to not make it worse. So we've talked about, Andrew talked about vehicles getting bigger. So we've uh, cars have gotten a lot more efficient over the last couple of decades, but uh, as Andrew said, we're driving more and we're driving bigger vehicles. So we need to move increasingly as we have electric vehicles to a system whereby you, you tax emissions on a life cycle basis so that if you have buy a very large vehicle with a very large battery, that's going to cost you a lot and you pay for the embedded emissions. Um, also, perhaps road pricing. We're going to need to grasp that nettle at some point, as Andrew said, in terms of uh, replacing the rev not just replacing the revenue from fuel duty, but also incentivizing different forms of transport, driving at less uh, less uh, congested periods of time. And then, more broadly than that, I think we're doing lots of good things. The Elizabeth Line is opened in London. It's beautiful, air conditioned. Uh, we're also big supporters of HS2. Um, it's controversial, of course, but there's no substitute for increasing real capacity. And I think, uh, as a converse to that. Uh, we should be very reticent to build new road networks because if you build it, they will come. There's a, I used to teach system dynamics at university, and if you build roads, they'll be used. So we should think very carefully about expanding the road network before we expand rail, cycling, and, and all our options. Yeah, interesting point. And the government on Friday, I know we all focused on the tax cuts, announced that a whole raft of road pro uh, projects would be accelerated. So it's an interesting dynamic when we're looking to obviously reduce uh, road demand. Um, Andrew, maybe I could bring you in, in next. And I will come back specifically to rail, because I think hopefully when Lou joins us, that's obviously an issue that's top of the political list. But kind of thoughts from you on the, on the modal shift side. It isn't necessary to get people to completely abandon their cars, um, just to use them less. Um, and actually, most people don't have a kind of sort of ideological tribal view about this. Most people are actually, you look at the polling, it's very clear, uh, roughly two thirds of those who express an opinion support, for instance, schemes to reduce um, rat running in their areas and one third oppose. And there's a big, there's a big um, group in the middle who neither support nor oppose, but there is, a, there is the majority support for these kind of measures. Um, it's just having the political will and political bravery to get through the inevitable backlash from the minority and, and, and see it through. When, um, 
when when uh, when Boris was mayor, I was working for him when he was mayor as well, mayor of London. Um, and uh, we did something called the Mini Hollands um, in a bit of London called Waltham Forest, and that involved restricting traffic movements in in Walthamstow Village. The first scheme, um, the Boris wanted to go to the opening um, to the opening ceremony for the first of these schemes, and I said, "No, no way, mate! It's going to be a shit show." Um, and uh, he turned up and uh, there were, uh, we, we turned up, he didn't go actually on my advice and um, there were 300 screaming demonstrators carrying a golden coffin to symbolise the death of Walthamstow Village. Um, now seven years later that place has been completely transformed and um, one of the men carrying the golden coffin, one of the principal opponents of the scheme, has opened a pavement cafe and is doing very nicely out of the fact that pedestrian and, and overall footfall has gone up dramatically. Um, it, it, it got through consultation very narrowly in 2015, 51% to 49, um, but now only 7% of people would take that scheme out. So what, ha what normally happens is that there's a, there's a period of backlash. Uh, if the council has the balls, as that council did, Waltham Forest Council did, Labour Council, um, to, to stick with it through the backlash. Um, that lasts about a year, 18 months, um, and, then, and then people forget they ever, they ever hated it and they, they never want to see, to see it gone. Um, so a lot of it is about political leadership, a lot of it is about politicians having the balls, and, it, and it's very, very clear, it's very interesting how different different councils are. It often comes down to the, the personal qualities of individual cabinet members at councils. Um, some are absolutely terrible, regardless of party. Some are brilliant, regardless of party. Um, and uh, so there's that. Um, and I think also, you know, we we, we have to start. Um, we, you know, we we cannot fetishise the car um, in the way that we have. So again, car ownership in London, particularly, is quite low. Um, only a third of people have access to a car in inner London, um, half of, less, fewer than half of households, a third of people. And, uh, and, and yet we sometimes behave as if everybody drives, which they really don't, in London and other big cities. And I think it's also about doing different things differently in different places. So what you can do in London uh, and some other big cities, in the inner areas of some other big cities where car ownership is low, is different from what you can do in um, a small town, where or, or a rural area where people genuinely do depend on their cars um and i think so you you, you can't have a one-size-fits-all policy great no and a good a good anecdote thanks andrew that's a good uh, sarah can i uh, turn to you next on the on the same question before we open it out to the floor yeah so i tend to agree with andrew i, I think um you know attitudes to vehicles are changing um you know there's been a drop in driving licenses i'm not sure that you know as kind of younger people kind of grow up and tend, will tend to have maybe a different relationship with how they see driving um so the average britain spends four years of their life driving is that not is that a good use of time uh we could be doing other things so i think once people see kind of these things actually I guess bringing them benefit because at the minute we do have a lot of problems with public transport we don't have avs kind of whizzing around the city giving us really cheap and accessible transport um, and i we're under no impression at we have that uh, deployment of fully driverless vehicles is not going to be without its challenges in terms of public trust and acceptance um but public trust and acceptance is definitely going to be a bigger challenge if we can't show people the direct benefit to their lives and so they're not going to embrace the technology if it doesn't feel like the technology is for them so that's um going to be a huge part of how we work with local councils, local communities and central government in, in deploying um, this technology. And, you know, ultimately we need to do it safely and we need to do it with a really robust regulatory framework and that's going to take years. So we need to see action from central government on starting to legislate for, um, for this technology. So we had a report from the Law Commission in January of this year which set out a comprehensive regulatory framework for deploying self-driving vehicles across all levels of automation. And ultimately it's going to take, um, you know, realistically probably another three to four years after we see primary the primary legislation that we need uh, to develop a full regulatory framework. And of course that's really, really important because ultimately that's our basis for deploying and then we need to do all the hard work to bring communities and the public along with us to actually trust this technology. Great, thanks. And uh, yeah, well, I will come back to each of the panelists on kind of something they really need to see from this government uh, in the next, um, and, and that's a, that's a good point on legislation. Um, so I'm now going to open it up to questions. I promised I'd come to the gentleman in the green shirt first, and I will honour that promise. There, there is a raving mic, um, which Alex will give you. So please do just briefly introduce yourself, and then a brief question. Yeah, very brief. Hi, Peter Walker. I'm a uh, Guardian journalist. 
Um, it's about driverless cars. So I guess it's Sarah, mainly for you, but I'd be interested in uh, everyone's views. Um, they've been supposedly just around the corner for many, many years, and they just don't seem to come. So I'm wondering if fully autonomous, or certainly level four or five, ever will come. And I'm also wondering if we actually think they're going to be a good thing, because one thing that seems to be mentioned quite a lot is the idea that because um, it's very, very difficult to get fully autonomous vehicles around vulnerable road users like people on scooters or bikes or on foot. And there's all these talk by car companies about having people to have like beacons or apps or things like that. So will this autonomous future be one where basically um, autonomous vehicles rule the cities and everyone else is just kind of, you know, told that the safety is up to them? You know, I I is there potentially more disbenefits and benefits to this? Thanks very much. I'll turn to you first, Sarah, um, but obviously others can come in after that. So people won't be expected to wear beacons or hats or use apps. Um, yes, I have seen a lot of kind of, uh, I suppose, ideas or recommendations recently that people shouldn't have to change for AVs. Of course they shouldn't. We would never have that approach. And actually the way that weird technology is developed is that it learns from the world around it. So it is, it's using end-to-end -end machine learning and it is developed daily in London, driving around London streets with completely normal infrastructure, just on the normal streets that you see today, um, and it's trained on the behaviours of expert driving instructors. So it doesn't require any changes to infrastructure around it. Whether we will have eventual infrastructure change with all of the development in the transport sector is, is a different question, but AVs, to deploy Waves AVs, we, we don't need it. Uh, in terms of safety, again, we, are, we collect data at pedestrians and other road users. And that means we are learning how to treat those uh, other road users safely. And ultimately, we will have to meet a safety standard before we can deploy our AVs. So there will be a huge amount of work that we will need to do before our technology is fully performant. And how we uh, demonstrate to what is likely to be the Vehicle Certification Agency um, on the safety. So we will have to bring a safety case and show huge amounts of evidence to show that our AVs are safe before we would, would deploy them. And ultimately, if we are selling the public on the benefit of AVs being that they are more safe, then they have to be more safe, ultimately. Great, thanks. And uh, Matt or Andrew want to come in on that point? Um, yeah, I just uh, briefly, I'm, I'm confident we will see fully automated vehicles. The automotive industry is very big. It has lots, lots of R&D budgets, and it's backed up by Silicon Valley these days as well. So I'm, I'm certain we'll crack the nut eventually. And I hope we do, because there's, there's an inclusivity benefit here as well. I mean, I have a, a blind friend, and I asked him, would he trust getting into an autonomous vehicle? And he says, yes, absolutely. And he, and he hopes to see it in his lifetime, because that would free him up to go anywhere he likes. And the, the other small point I'd make is... Uh, we should make sure that autonomous vehicles don't make the decarbonisation problem harder. Because if autonomous vehicles become so convenient that we use it like an Uber to get everywhere, that would be disastrous for emissions and material usage and so on. So we need to guard against that. Yep. No, and it's a good example. I talked earlier about the kind of wider socioeconomic benefits potentially of this transition, and that that kind of clearly is is one you've given. Andrew, do you want to add anything before we move on? I think I yes, I I I'd echo that. I think I, I think. Um, autonomous vehicles are almost certainly already safer than, um, than, than driven vehicles. A machine makes fewer mistakes than a human being. They don't get drunk, um, they don't get tired. Um, but uh, um, there's a psychological perception of risk, of course, that has to be overcome. Um, and I think my concern about it, bluntly, is the potential for, um, for uh, um, significantly expanded numbers of cars on the roads. So an AV is a more effective user of efficient use of road space than a than a than a a, a, a private driven car. Um, they can platoon, for instance, and they can bunch together, take up your road space. But but they are a less efficient road user of road space than a bus or a bicycle. Um, and uh, and I think if you lower the barriers to car use by as much as AVs could, you will see massively expand the demand for road space. And so I think you you won't see less traffic. You'll see a lot more, uh, and the roads won't be able to cope. So I think that's going to be the issue with AVs. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so I'm going to come uh, to the gentleman on the right, and then I'll come to the, I think, the, I can see a hand there. I can't see who's attached. Oh, the lady there in the blue as well. Um, and I'll take both questions, if that's okay, and then we'll put them around the panel. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Brad Baines, County Councillor for Oxfordshire County Council. Um, I wanted to kind of ask a question that brings the kind of politics and policy together. Um, the national kind of the delivery of active travel infrastructure has obviously been highly dependent on national funding and local leadership, as Andrew's talked about. And I was wondering, um, 
Boris Johnson, despite me not wanting to say, has actually done a hell of a lot for active travel um, policy in the UK through his kind of spearheading and the work of people like Andrew. Uh, as part of that, and I was wondering, with the change of Prime Minister, what happens to that? What is the future of active travel policy and infrastructure in the UK? And to bring it to a Labour context, what should Labour policy be following that kind of legacy and impact that Boris Johnson has kicked off? Thanks, and I'll come back to you in a second. A lady in the blue. Hi, I'm Leslie Rudd. I'm chief executive at a charity called Electrical Safety First. Um, so what I'm really interested in is there's been lots of talk about the vehicles, and I'm pleased to hear there was lots of talk about safety. But um, what I wanted to know was what about the charging, because we've done quite a few investigations where we found quite dangerous charging practices, and there isn't actually enough charging points. And also there's been a sort of change in policy around grants to have home chargers. So I just wanted to know if you could sort of expand the debate out to how we charge these vehicles as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, both very good questions. I'm going to come to Andrew on the on the Boris uh, kind of future of active travel, and then I'll come to Matt on the on the charging infrastructure side, if that's all right. So, Andrew, you kick off. Well, I hope the new government realises that active travel is actually an answer to an awful lot of problems. Um, so, uh, it's it's an answer to problems of health. It's an answer to problems of pollution. It's an answer to problems of congestion. Um, I've always argued that active travel is an extremely Tory way of, um, of, of traveling because it's individualistic. Um, and, uh, and I think um, it can replace the, the, you know, the ability to do individual journeys that private cars give you in a way that public transport um, sometimes can't. So I hope they continue with the policies that we have, um, that we have been pursuing with, you know, as, I, as I mentioned, considerable success over the last three years. Thanks. And any thoughts on Labour? What should Labour's position be on the on the issue? Um, I think I, I, mean, I worked quite closely with some Labour councillors on this stuff. Um, uh, there are, as I said, as I said, there were varying levels of commitment and support. Some marvellous, some terrible. Um, Labour authorities and some marvellous and some terrible Tory authorities as well. Um, I think. Uh, that they've got to. I mean, what 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 disappointed me some uh, somewhat about dealing with some some Labour authorities. Obviously, you know, people in the Labour Party go into politics perhaps more than the Tory Party, arguably, to change the world. Um, a lot of people in the Tory Party want the world to stay roughly as it is, but people in the Labour Party want to change the world. But it, it was depressing to me, particularly when I was in London, how many Labour politicians saw themselves as defenders of the status quo. I remember having a uh, an argument one with a uh, South London MP, Labour MP. He was complaining that um, we wanted to take some parking spaces out in, in Dulwich or somewhere. And, um, and and I said to her, look, you know, I mean, you've got a majority of like 26,000 or something. Um, well, you know, why not sacrifice, a, you know, a few dozen of those votes to, uh, to to make the place better for everyone? Why go into politics if you, if you, you know, why become a Labour MP if you don't want to change anything? Um, so I, I hope... You know that that councillors and, and 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 politicians of all parties will have the courage to embrace this change because it really does work and it works really quickly and, and it's and it's popular. There's quite a lot of evidence from the local elections that um, again, you know, um, quite a lot of Tory um, councils and councillors tried to campaign against these schemes didn't avail them very much. The, uh, the on on the whole, the people that that put these schemes in did not suffer electorally. Thanks very much. And uh, just moving on to the charging uh, question, Matt. Yeah, so there is a risk that electric vehicle sales increase at such a rate that the charging infrastructure and the electricity system can't cope. At the minute, electric vehicles are going upwards, but there's still a relatively small amount of them in the road. And there are, f there are a few challenges to that. At a national level, you need to provide the electricity somehow. That's probably the easiest challenge. We can provide that at a national level uh, fairly easily. The local network is where it gets more difficult because electric vehicles don't tend to be evenly spread around the country. You know, keeping up the, with the Joneses effect, somebody will buy a Tesla and then a, the next one will think, oh, I like that Tesla, I'll buy one. And so you get a, a local problem. And the third is on the chargers themselves. We're going to need to install millions of these all around the country. And it's not just a uh, challenge for the network, but skills. Who's going to install all these chargers? So we need to train thousands and thousands of people. And it can't just be in London. It has to be all around the country to, to keep up with demand. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, great. I'm going to come back to questions in the room then. Uh, so I can see the lady at the front here and then the gentleman with the 
tie on at the middle. That's a very bad description, but... <laughs> Hi, um, yes, another Guardian journalist, I'm afraid. Uh, my name's Helen Pidd. I'm the Guardian's North of England editor, and um, I set up um, an organisation an organization called Walk Ride Greater Manchester, which is a walking and cycling advocacy um, group. It's probably a question for, maybe for Andrew more than anybody else. It's about a reallocation of road space. So we know that if you, if you segregate um, cycle lanes, then people use them, but obviously it's the big controversial thing, taking, taking space away from cars. I mean, to what extent do the panel think that that should be something imposed by central government, or do you leave it to local government, which has a tendency to bottle it when things get a little bit difficult? There was a car-free day in Liverpool yesterday, the day before, and they reopened the road because they got so many complaints. This is just one day. So, um, yeah, what's the, the mix between central government and local government? Question. Yeah, Dominic Weeks, uh, Zero Avia. Um, we are developing hydrogen electric zero emission engines for aviation. So I'm curious as to the panel's views. I know we're taking a bit of a, a multimodal shift here, but to the views on uh, the Jet Zero strategy and what that means for domestic aviation. And then possibly a second question, if I may, what the general view of, of hydrogen across the transport um, and the hydrogen strategy and what that means for transport. Excellent. I'm going to turn actually to Sarah first just on the uh, question around local versus central government, and specifically obviously around the utilisation of road space. I'll then come to Andrew uh, obviously on the on the same question and then the Jet Zero piece and then I think probably Matt you'll want to definitely come in on the on the broader side. Yeah, so obviously as I said before, big benefit obviously of reducing vehicles on the road is, is freeing up that space for cycle lanes and, 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 and more space for people to take active travel options. Um, you know, to echo what Andrew said earlier, obviously it's it's a really sort of patchwork across the UK around councils who I guess are making that shift. Um, ultimately, to see kind of the widespread benefits and, and build up that kind of public acceptance and trust, it would it would need to be kind of further than just seeing kind of I guess quite big changes from in one borough. If you're say in Waltham Forest, and you don't see any of those benefits if you kind of move across to another borough. So I do think there's something in. I guess giving cover to local councils by actually having more central government mandated um, approaches to this because, uh, you know, as you said before, it's, you can think about local, uh, you know, local politicians are afraid of losing support um, and transport does seem to bring out, the, I guess, the most passionate opinions in people <laughs> um, at a local level. So I think there is an element of, um, do, yeah, do we need to see more action from kind of a central, uh, central government kind of, Give give people that coverage that we're not getting caught up in kind of local, I guess, local kind of fights around it, which ultimately at the end of the day is not going to see the transformation that we need because I think we do really need a transformation, right? It's not an evolution. These the things that we're talking about today are, are huge changes and require real long termist view. So, you know, even taking um AVs in it as an example we are not going to see AVs widespread deployed for many years. Going back to the original question around um, the challenge of developing that technology, yes, it's the it's the technology that's been hyped and hyped and hyped and never arrived. Um, we obviously think we've got a way of, of bringing that technology uh, to market from WAVE, um, but ultimately there are so many other things that need to go into that, and that does require a much more long-term long view than we're used to taking at a local and central level at the moment. Right, thanks, Sarah. And Andrew, just on that question, and then obviously your thoughts on the on the aviation side as well. Um, we had a two pronged approach. So yes, we we said we would not fund any council which didn't want to do things to an acceptable standard. Um, and we didn't force them to, but we just said you're not going to get any funding for for rubbish. Um, and uh, so much uh, cycling infrastructure uh, in the past has been terrible. Um, sort of it's lines painted on roads and then they give up at places you you need them and um and we we made pretty clear we weren't going to fund any of that so if you didn't want to do anything good you can get any money uh, which was um something of an incentive uh we're also um consulting on something called um incentivization more widely where you have to show you're performing for um for in in ev charging in active travel and in bus priority um, and again, the standards you were held to depend that differed from area to area. So, you know, uh, in a in a Manchester was held to a higher standard than um, than Tamworth. Um, uh, you had to you had to show you're performing in those standards to uh, to receive money for other forms of transport. A portion of your funding for highways depended on how 
while you were doing on those. We are we were we were consulting on that. Um, so I hope the new government continues with that. Um, but we're also doing things to um, to help councils manage these schemes better. One one reason why they sometimes fail and get taken out is not just that councillors are sometimes um, lack you know lack political will, um, but but that they they often handle things like consultations quite badly. Um, and there is in fact there are you know a series of quite technical things you can do um, to to make sure a scheme lands better. So you know you have to plan it in great detail. You have to anticipate and preempt objections. You have to collect good before and after data to try and um, to try and uh, to try and preempt the kind of objections that people always make, like this increases traffic congestion, increases pollution, and so on. Um, but, you know there there is actually a, a checklist of things that a council can do to to increase a scheme's chances of success. So one of the things we've launched is a, um, a new arm's length body of the DFT called Active Travel England, um, which will oversee the cycling budget, but it will also, in, in, in the ways I've described, but it will also um, try and spread best practice throughout local authorities and, and try and show, you know, um, those with the collie wobbles why it actually has worked in other places and what, and what they did to make it work. Um, and and that, I hope, will, will lead to greater spread of best practice. But there is a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of people who just want to talk about like things and don't do it and don't want to do anything, including people with enormous mandates who are at no political risk whatsoever. Andy Burnham, mayor of Greater Manchester, the great radical, the new Labour radical hero, I'm hearing. Um, he is, you know, he has refused even to put in a tiny charging clean air zone in central Manchester. Great central Manchester is uh, is is has got the uh, has got the highest levels of asthma, the highest levels of lung disease in the country. Um, and despite having, despite winning every single one of the 215 wards in Greater Manchester at the election last year, despite um, a plurality of 48 points, he got 67% to I think 19% um, in the in the mayor election. He still doesn't feel he has the political strength to charge um, to charge a few vans and taxes a few quid for driving into central Manchester. And that is the kind of level of cowardice and feebleness that we're dealing with and, um, and and so there is a role for central government on that thanks andrew and i, I uh, andy Burman's in most of i think of the other fringes so maybe someone yeah. a chance to answer well, that question he, he's the kind of guy that's brilliant he, he can talk the talk but actually walking walk even in a tiny way he, he's not up for it thanks andrew and then i just on the aviation question i want to do quickly uh, before we move on um and matt maybe you can come in on that yeah, so if we were sitting here 10 to 15 years ago, we would probably de be debating hydrogen versus battery electric cars. I think it's probably clear that battery electric cars have won that race for the time being at least. But in maritime and aviation, we think that uh, hydrogen can have a role. And it's, it's an open debate. I'm not an expert in this field, but lots of my members are. And it's an open debate about how that hydrogen will be used, whether it's used directly in a fuel cell, whether it's combusted directly. But we think there could be a role for hydrogen as a feedstock for sustainable liquid fuels, which might be beneficial, particularly in aerospace. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm going to take probably one final group of questions, uh, which is always dangerous. Someone puts the hand up there. The gentleman with the red shirt there and the tie. Um, and then also the lady over there, uh, if that's all right. Yep, the lady's got a hand up with a pen. Hi there. I'm Toby Poston from the uh, British Vehicle Rental and Leasing Association. So our members only operate about 4 million cars, vans and trucks, well over 100, 150,000 electric vehicles. Um, interesting to get your thoughts on how the potential for uh, ever increasing energy prices to sort of, um, if not derail, but severely damage the, the transition to, to electric transport. We're certainly seeing in our industry where um, it's beginning to have an impact both at grassroots level in terms of drivers that have been giving EVs and trying to push them back and fleets actually delaying rollout or even mothballing electric fleets because they're just really concerned about the costs. Great. And the lady over there. Hi, Sandra Johnson, Constain Group, PLC. I'm actually going to talk in a personal capacity. Um, I'm really interested in the cost of all this and making it more inclusive for all communities. So if you're talking about driverless cars, I mean, it sounds amazing. Hydrogen, it's very costly and we're in a cost of living crisis. How are we gonna bring communities and different communities along this journey? Great question. I might come to Sarah you on the communities question in a second. Um, just on the on the kind of high energy costs and how that's impacting the dynamic. Matt, do you wanna start on that? 
Yeah, so I think if you operate fleets and it's coordinated, there's big opportunities here because the, the electricity system will need to be more actively managed in the future. So if fleet owners are willing to offer up this big, you know, well of batteries to absorb excess electricity at times of high supply and to supply it back during times of high demand, then there could be opportunities to reduce your costs and even to generate revenue by selling electricity to the grid. Yeah, in the short term, yeah, we're all we're all going to have to swallow a bit of high energy energy prices, unfortunately. Okay. And uh, Andrew, Dave, you want to come in on the prices question as well? I mean, at the moment, um, it's still cheaper to run an EV than a, than a, than a nice vehicle. Um, but obviously, that price differential is lowering because electricity prices are rising. But uh, electricity is taxed much less heavily than petrol or diesel, so it should still be advantageous um, in, in terms of running costs. Thanks. And then on the community involvement question, particularly, Sarah, maybe you start on that? Well, yeah, also talk about the cost and investment, because obviously, yes, your point, it's going to cost a lot of money to get um, all of these uh, transformations in, um, in transport in the UK, but ultimately we need to also think about the huge benefits to the economy. So... Self-driving alone is estimated to be worth 40 billion to the UK economy by 2035 and introduce 38,000 new jobs. And those jobs would be across um, highly skilled technical roles in fleet management and uh, fleet maintenance. And ultimately there's a lot of jobs, as with a lot of developments in AI, there's a lot of jobs that we don't know about yet that will appear. Um, so for example, we employ a lot of um, AV safety operators in WAVE who um, have come from jobs in blue light driving and driving instructors who actually are there to make sure that our AVs learn how to drive like extremely competent drivers, um, which is I think is a nice example of a job that we wouldn't have thought of existing before. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about obviously if the UK moves on this, uh, globally the market's estimated to be around two trillion. And so ultimately if we want to see, um, you know, if we want to kind of be able to drum up those, uh, the, the investment for those costs, we need to make movements in, in developing the technology. And it does open up um, huge opportunities for foreign direct investment with Series B this year was a really good example of that. Uh, we raised over $200 million. Um, so the, there is the element of um, the kind of the investment opportunity. But again, those kinds of local jobs in fleet management and uh, deliveries, because there will still be people involved in those processes. We aren't going to, we can't remove people from the end to end journey. We will actually be able to, um, I guess, bring people into roles that are potentially more useful or highly skilled than um, just having their time being spent driving. They can then get involved in other aspects of the end to end journey. So I think it's about making sure that. Um, you know, communities are aware of the benefits because I think it's fair to say that uh, the, the benefits of automated vehicles and self-driving are not well understood at this point. Yeah, I think we should just mention community energy schemes as well because there are more and more of these taking off and Community Energy England, if you go to their website, you can see what's happening, but there are housing estates that, cr that build their own s their solar panels and in the future you'll be able to trade energy between different homes on the, on the same system and there are even new housing estates being built that have something called a community battery or community heat store where you all share the, the electricity and you can, you can even ha find out about the technology uh, behind it as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. And um, I am going to kind of close this to an end, but I am going to finish with my one question from me um, uh, as chair. I think we've talked a lot about the kind of challenges of today. So I think it would just be worth a quick thought from every every panelist just about what are the what is the single thing that this government, current government, could do to really accelerate the decarbonisation journey that we've talked about today. And maybe I'll start with uh, you, Matt, and then move to Sarah and then Andrew. Sure. So I think we're on our way with the power system and we need to accelerate the rollout of all low carbon electricity so that we can actually get on with uh, electrifying the system without it crashing or without prices going too high. That includes all renewable electricity sources, solar, wind, biomass, and of course, uh, my background, nuclear energy. <laughs> Very good. Got the nuclear point in there, Sarah? Yeah, so I'll just, I guess, say my previous point on legislation before. We've got a long road ahead with a bit of a pun on self-driving. So um, we need to see action on legislation this year. Um, we are really looking forward to having confirmation on the future of transport bills from WAVE because that's where we hope to see self-driving included in the next parliamentary session. Great, thanks. And Andrew, without mentioning Andy Burnham. I think um, I, I'd agree with Matt on nuclear. Um, I think uh, that's probably the quickest way to kind of fully decarbonise the energy system. Um, and I think we need to be 
bolder in the policies of the kind of way we've been discussing that that have been pursued. Um, so, but whether or not we manage that, I don't know. Right. Well, thanks everyone for for joining. I think we've had a really useful discussion. Apologies, Lou Hay didn't join us. Um, we'll have to leave questions on rail nationalisation to the next fringe. Um, but luckily, there are a range of other policy exchange events if people are keen to join and continue the discussion on a variety of themes. Um, but appreciate the time, and hopefully that was useful. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys.